Yesterday, Italy's highest criminal court overturned the acquittal of Amanda Knox in the 2007 murder of her roommate, Meredith Kircher, and ordered a retrial. Headlines around the world exploded, asking, what does this all mean? Will Amanda have to return to Italy? Could she be found guilty a second time around? Joining me to answer all of these questions is uh, a team of fascinating people who will help us also understand what our collective obsession with Amanda Knox is all about. We have in the Google Hangout Antonia Laterza, a blog assistant at Huffington Post Italia, Casey Greenfield, an attorney and HuffPost blogger, Nina Burley, author of The Fatal Gift of Beauty, The Trials of Amanda Knox, also a columnist at the New York Observer. And last and certainly not least, we're joined by Richard Roth, a trial attorney. Richard, let me start with you. Talk to me about what happened uh, yesterday. What does this news all mean? Sure. There are essentially 16 reasons why the prosecutors determined that uh, the, uh, uh, the decision by the appellate court should be overturned. And we know as of yesterday that the Supreme Court, the Court of uh, Cassation, Cessation they call it in Italy, actually did agree with the prosecutors and overturned the appellate court decision. We don't know any if it's one or two or 15 or 16 of the reasons, but they did agree with the, with the prosecutor, which results in um, there being an, another trial with Amanda. Uh, what's gonna happen is within the next 90 days, we will get a written decision from the court, which will tell us which of the reasons they believe that the forensic evidence was not properly looked at, the witnesses were incredible, et cetera. And from there, we will go back, the sides put their positions in 45 days later, and we will presumably have a trial on the same thing that she was acquitted of back in 2009. Which is so fascinating to me. You know, maybe I watch too much Law and Order, but, uh, you know, I hear about, you know, concepts of, of double jeopardy and, 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 and I wonder, how much of that is applicable here? I wonder what we can expect to see in a retrial. Well, that's a toughie because what happens here, we're pinning two very important uh, treatises against each other. We have this extradition treaty where the U.S. and Italy both agree that we should uh, be allowed to extradite or to deliver to the other country someone that the country that requests it wants. On the other hand, we have the U.S. Constitution, which says that a citizen should not be tried twice. And they're both, there's joggerheads. They're both being pinned against each other here. And the question is essentially which one will prevail. A lot of legal ex experts have gone back and forth in the last 24 hours. I will tell you that this has come up before. In 2010, there was a decision in Mexico which overturned an appellate division decision convicting a previously acquitted defendant. And the U.S. did extradite that person to Mexico, as well as in 1974 in Canada, they have a similar proceeding in which case uh, the U.S. did extradite that person, even though it was a claim of double jeopardy to Canada. So we don't know where this is going to go, but it's getting. No, no, Rich, Richard, is, is this an issue of having a more complex legal analysis such that you don't think that, jeopardy, that je double jeopardy actually applies? Or is this a, rel uh, a sort of relative indifference uh, to double jeopardy in an international context? Well, from our perspective, from the U.S. perspective, we believe it's double jeopardy. She was acquitted in 2011 by the appellate court. So therefore, if you're acquitted, you cannot be retried. But the Italian system is saying, ah, this isn't double jeopardy. We're looking at questions of law, and this is part of the entire process. So uh, I would say to you as an American lawyer, I believe it to be double jeopardy. Italians would say otherwise. That's a, that's a, that's, that raises a really fascinating legal question about sort of how we think about double jeopardy here which airs strongly on the side of the convicted or formerly, or non-convicted person, certainly on, on, the, on the, uh, the defendant, and to the extent that even if the court made an error and the person's uh, not guilty verdict was in error or some, because of a matter of law, the court says, well, our hands are tied, you're done, you're free, we can't do this again. Italy has a much more complex issue, and obviously Italian law goes back, you know, thousands of years. And they have a much more, I would argue, a much more complicated system. They're making the case that the court has a right to do this because the court didn't get it right the first time. It's very complicated, and what, and, and not to mention the fact that now it involves, involves the, the Brits, because the woman who was killed, Miss Kircher, was from Great Britain, an intern from Great Britain. So we have the Brits who really want um, Amanda Knox to, to, to be tried, and we have the Americans who are saying enough is enough, and the Italians are saying everyone has to abide by our system. So it becomes an international affair. Oh, it's absolutely an, an, an international affair, and uh, Amanda's lawyer, uh, has been adamant in saying that this international struggle will continue. It is and unfortunate. To fight. And uh, so we look forward to, to, to read the motivation first, to, 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 to decide which strategy.
No, Amanda is not coming for, for the moment. She doesn't need to come back because there's no decision on this. She's a free, free citizen, but she will follow the case. After that, uh, Amanda's official statement comes up, and she says uh, it was painful to receive the news that the Italian Supreme Court decided to send my case back for revision when the prosecution's theory of my involvement in Meredith's murder has been repeatedly revealed to be completely unfounded and unfair. I believe that any questions as to my innocence must be examined by an objective investigation and a capable prosecution. The prosecution responsible for the many discrepancies in their work must be made to answer for them, for Raphael's sake, my sake, and most especially for the sake of Meredith's family. Our hearts go out to them no matter what happens. My family and I will face this continuing legal battle as we always have, confident in the truth and with our heads held high in the face of wrongful accusations and unreasonable adversity. This is, I mean, this, this is a great statement. This is a great way to respond from a strategic perspective. I guess my question comes uh, in terms of sort of how the court of public opinion deals with this. Antonia, you're able to witness this not from the American context, or not purely from the American context, but you're there in Italy. What are you seeing? I know this was the big, one of the biggest stories of the day yesterday here. How, how is this playing out in Italy? Hi, everyone. Um, yes, I mean, there was a lot of uh, coverage here as well, but I think... Um, what people are uh, thinking here is that it's not a question. I mean, this court is not ruling on the, you know, on the merit of the, of this case. Is not, uh, you know, Amanda is not uh, requested to come back on the basis that she's been found guilty or that she's there are new evidences. It's a matter. Of, it's a matter of legal issues. It's just a technical fact, you know. And it happens very often in Italy, uh, actually, that. Um, the Supreme Court rules, you know, that the process wasn't done, uh, wasn't done properly, and so it has to be redone. So it's it's not something strange here. Nina, you Nina, you hear that there is a retrial being ordered. You see Amanda saying, "Look, we didn't do this. We're going to keep pressing forward." You hear her lawyer saying that as well. You see Americans kind of ambivalent over this. Uh, you hear many Italians taking a, a much more strident position against her. When you see all of that, I mean, you're, you're the expert on this. What do you think? What, how do you make sense of what the next phase of this is? I think you're muted there. Uh, can, do me a favor, Nina. Can you hit the unmute button there? Uh, yes, there unmuted. Hi. Uh, my first reaction yesterday was surprise. Um, but on reflection and um, listening to people like Antonia from Italy talk about the uh, what's happening there, I think... You know, it's it really is just the Italian court system working its way through uh, this this case. Uh, they have a they have a system of checks and balances there. The Florentine judges check the Perugian judges. Um, in fact, Mignini, the prosecutor, the sort of notorious prosecutor who has satanic cult theories, supposedly, um, he has been called up before the Florentine panel um, and almost disbarred for some of his. Um, uh, behavior in a previous case. I guess he's, he's survived that. But anyway, my overall impression is that the publicists at HarperCollins are jumping up and down <laughs> with joy right now. Um, as, a, as an author uh, uh, who's worked with these companies, I can tell you that the timing could not have been more propitious for her book coming out next month. And the only thing I can imagine that would pro be a problematic is if and maybe Richard or one of the other lawyers there can address this, is whether the lawyers like Barnett, her agent down in Washington, and others are going to recommend that she hold off on publishing that book um, in case there's something in it that's going to piss off the police and the prosecutor and put them in a position of, of you know, accusing her again of slander. Because that, that, they, are very quick to, they are very quick to do that right now. No, absolutely. She, she's already got a defamation conviction over there, so... <laughs> I mean, she's already, been, Amanda Knox already has a defamation conviction there. Um, well, yeah, that, that's what's interesting to me, Casey. Like field or sent back. Casey, that's what's so interesting to me, though. I mean, the, the two things. One, the Italian court's response to this. I mean, she's actually already, I mean, basically fulfilled a three-year uh, sentence. Uh, for one thing, she has defamation uh, claims against her, uh, charges against her. Um, conviction. Conviction, she has really. A conviction, yeah, and um, it's not that hasn't been sent back for revision, as far as I understand it. No, it, it actually hasn't. You're absolutely right. So it seems to me that the Italian court just has an entirely different disposition. I'm hearing Nina say she doesn't want to piss off the the, the Italians. It seems to me that they're sufficiently pissed at her. I mean, it seems to me that the entire system 
is sort of lined up against her, as well as a court of public opinion. That's a pretty sharp contrast from what she's getting in other countries, particularly here in the States and maybe even in Canada. Well, I think that a couple of things have happened. One is that, as Nina alluded, the prosecutor in this case has an enormous amount of egg on his face left over from a, a notorious previous uh, case that's widely known as the Monster of Florence case. Also, the you know Italy right now it does not have a very good position on the world stage. You know, it's, its government is in flux. It just had an inconclusive election. And there is definitely a case to be made to say that this is a, an example of Italy trying to or part of the Italian system kind of trying to assert itself on the world stage um, in a moment when they don't have a whole lot, a lot of power. Also, this, this appeal has been in the works for a long time. I do agree with Nina that it was suspicious or, or at least curious that the timing is just weeks out from her, from her book release. Um, but, but this appeal didn't spring up out of nowhere. It's, it's, it's as we see from the U.S. Supreme Court, that's not how appeals go down. But here's what I don't get, right? There, there's a comment coming in from Unlisted to You who raises a really interesting point. He says, because poorly gathered contaminated evidence looks so much better the second time around or what? Like, what, what do we expect to see? And I know the, the, uh, the, the high court's uh, uh, reflection response uh, commentary on this case won't come for a, another few months, but what's your best guess of what argument they could make for why a, a case that was so poorly put together so poorly investigated, could now be re-examined with some kind of different, more fruitful result. Well, that happens all the time, at least even in the United States, when we, our appellate system is significantly different, as I'm sure Richard can explain. We review the record on appeal of cases, but people always want a second bite at the apple. Here, meaning another chance to make the same arguments. And remember, in this case, it's highly this is a, a, a lot of this is abstraction and is hypothetical in that not only would the outcome of the case have to be against Amanda Knox, but also the U.S. would have to agree to an extradition request. And it's pretty common practice for the U.S. Department of Justice not to extradite people if they think that it's in violation of the U.S. Constitution. So what we're mostly talking about here is actually an academic argument or a reputational argument. So why wouldn't the Italian court system try to make the same arguments? I mean, they, they looked ridiculous last time. Fair, fair enough. Richard, would you concur with that? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's interesting. There's a very good article today in the New York Times uh, op-ed section, the very end of the section, the first section, that talks about how uh, DNA evidence and why look at it again. And the I think it was a mathematician who actually did it. And the bottom line is that what was done back in 2000, 2008, these V DNA, little samples of DNA, is very different than what can be done today. We've gone, we, we, we've moved leaps and bounds on the DNA issue. So for example, if in fact they do it, there, there was a decision not to retest the blood on a knife. If they retested the blood on the knife today, you can learn a lot more than you could have seven years ago. So it may very well be that this appellate court, and I do agree with one of the, one of the um, I think it was Nina who said that we have to let the system take it, you know, let it run its course. That's very true. It's terrible and it's frustrating and it's painful and it's scary for Amanda Knox, but um, assuming that in fact it does run its course and assuming we can get new DNA evidence and we can get the forensic better, it may get to the ultimate truth. So um, there is, you know, as much as it pains me to see a person, what I believe, go through double jeopardy, although the Italian lawyers would not agree with me, um, if we could get to the truth and if we can get the same, the right result, uh, with this appeal, then it's good for the U.S. and the Italian system. Well, I'll tell you what's not good for the Italians, Nina. It's, it's, this, it's the fact that this is a public case, a public controversy. I think Italians are embarrassed by this. They're not like us. You know, we sort of, we, we love the, the muck and the mire of, 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 of tawdry cases. You know, we love having a, a beautiful defendant. Oh, they love them, too. They love them, too. They have an entire section of their newspapers devoted to this type of story. It's called the Cronache Nere. And every day they've got, this was, this is, the media uh, piece of this is one of the, one of the elements that I cover in my book about why it's, we have such an obsession with it. The Italians are just like us. They are as obsessed with beautiful young women accused of lurid crimes as we are. And, you know, the reason why we're all sitting here, that you've got two New York lawyers and me sitting here talking to you about this right now and not talking about, you know, the domestic violence guy, the man who, who just bashed his wife's head in. Yeah. Um, and that is happening on a daily basis in this country and in 
Italy. Domestic violence is a massive problem. Why is Nancy Grace not perp walking those guys every day? Because we are more interested in women and young women especially, especially sexy photogenic women who are accused of crimes. And the Italians are exactly like us in that. They devote their, they devote, you know, hours and hours to it just like we do. And that's something that is really at the base of why this case continues It's to some extent. It's a media well, phenomenon, talk, talk to me about it's this. a social I, I, phenomenon. No, I want you all to talk to me about that. And, and Tony, you, you're there. You know, we, we have, uh, if, if, if Nina's right, we have a, a culture that is obsessed with these types of cases, uh, both here in America and apparently in Italy as well. And a big part of it might be, some argue, gender. And not just gender but also beauty, right? That when, I mean, would we be talking about this if Amanda Knox were a regular looking truck driver, you know, man from, you, you know what I mean? Like, is, is her attractiveness and her gender the reason why we're talking about this? How do gender issues play out, do you think? I think it's definitely a big part of it. I mean, when she, uh, you know, uh, I mean, during this period of time, we haven't spoke about it, you know, during these four or five years that have passed, we haven't spoke about it for a long time. And, you know, I think the fact that we are all of a sudden so interested again in this case has a lot to do with the fact that she's, you know, beautiful and she's also a bit contradictory. You know, she has this angel and devil kind of double personality. You know, she looks so angelical and so uh, innocent. So I think... The Italian media has concentrated a lot on her personality and we're really interested in understanding her, you know, the psychology behind it and uh, who she really is and, you know, I but, think there's a lot of interest, definitely. They also think she's guilty, right? I mean, let's be honest. Most Italians think she's guilty. Most Italians side with the victim. So they, they you know, they, they support Meredith, yes. I would say that but, but they, so, they're, might, I mean, not just Amanda, they're also against uh, Raffaele, you know, who's who was her ex and he's involved too. So, you know, it's not, they're, they're against the people that are, you know, possibly. But why do they not? Not to mention the, the fact that there's also Rudy someone Day. else who's already been convicted of this crime. Well, I mean, they never talk about Rudy Gaudet. Yes, exactly, exactly. exactly. You know, the results, so the results an element of class. I mean, the guy, the variant guy that has been indicted is, you know, this, uh, this guy who, who couldn't really support his case, whereas Amanda and Raffaele are two, you know, wealthy, young people. And, you know, so I think there's also an element of Italians feel that, you know, this, that they kind of got away because they could afford it. You know, there's, I mean, this is a big problem in Italy as well with justice. So, so because it's so long. So are Italians looking at her as someone who was trying to skate by on good looks and charm? Because um, I'm hearing uh, conversations about Satanism, uh, you know, Masonic devil worshiping. I'm hearing like, I mean, it's, 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 it's striking how different the conversation is about Amanda Knox uh, here than what I'm hearing through Italian sources about how her identity uh, publicly is being constructed in the Italian media. Yes, yes, there are talks about orgies and, you know, satanic, um, I don't know, cults. And I mean, I think, yes, in, in, the, in the American media, she's seen as this uh, naive student who got trapped in the Italian legal system. But here, it's not, you know, she's not seen like that. She's seen as this uh, contradictory young woman and, you know, sexy woman. And I mean, she's definitely people think that she's involved in it. So, you know, let's remember, not, let's, part, let's part of that cultural sort of narrative, that, part of that cultural narrative difference is, is, can, can be explained, isn't just about good and evil, right? I mean, my recollection, I haven't reviewed this in a long time, but my recollection is that some of that narrative was, was constructed, and I'm sure Nina knows this in great detail, was constructed as, as her defense. I mean, wasn't it her own attorneys who, who used the Jessica Rabbit comparison I yes, think that that's the, just the kind of her thing. own attorneys yeah. did construct. I mean, that was Julia Bongiorno, that was Selecito's attorney. But, but the construct. I mean, you hear it in a, in Antonia, where she she immediately says she's an angel devil. She has a beautiful face, but an internal witch. And and that. How do you? How does anybody know that about her? That was presented from day one by the prosecutor. It was a creation. It wasn't, nobody, I mean, I went to Seattle and interviewed her friends, and I can tell, if you read my book, you will understand, she does have an internal life that's, that's different from what is presented. But it's not, you know, witchcraft. It's psychology. And it's, you know, growing up in America and growing up in suburban Seattle. And by the way, she's, they're not rich people, and I'm not one of her advocates. Um, 
you know, but they're not rich at all by the standards. Of, and, and the other thing that you have to remember and, and that Antonia touched on again is this class issue with Rudy Gaudet. It's not just class. Let's talk about what it is. Race. It's race. Yes. And in Italy, Italy is a homogeneous country. It's a, it's a society where there are no black, or there, I think there's one black member of the 600 member parliament. And these yeah. black Oh, that's, so, that's totally different than America. <laughs> well, yeah. All those black exactly. senators floating around. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Yes, but we have a black president, excuse me, and we have black mayors, and they don't have anything like that. It is much, much different. And what they have done there is they, they re it's sort of like a reverse compassion racism where they won't even allow Rudy Gaudet agency as a person. They didn't even investigate who he was. I went over there a year into the case. I thought Amanda Knox was guilty, and I was the first one to do Journalism 101 on Rudy Gaudet. He's a really interesting character. He may be the most interesting person in the whole case. He was brought to Italy when he was five. He was raised as an Italian boy, and yet he has to check in with the police every year as a, as a guest. He is not considered an Italian, and he had all sorts of <laughs> mental issues. His, you know, I interviewed friends who did, who'd partied with him, who were American, who he would go into fugue states. He would wake up at night and, and sleepwalk. He would, he, he, had, he would not sleep in his own house because he was afraid he would wake up four miles away. He was committing burglaries every weekend. None of these things were brought out or, or, or focused on by the Italian media, nor by the UK press, because the UK press, Murdochian as it is, was stirring the pot. And those British reporters knew better. They knew to go up to Milan and interview Gaudet's family and friends. And nobody did it, because it was a great story. And it was a great story that has to do with sex and a pretty girl. Exactly. And, which, and it's, fun, it's, fun, it's and funny you say stuff. that because so many of the comments we've gotten, not just at HuffPost Live, but on Twitter, have been all about her looks. And it's almost as if people are willing to give her a murder pass. And I'm not saying she did it. But people are saying that, look, even if she did, we don't care because we like how she looks. Check out this comment that comes in from Phil uh, or Kept Skillet on Twitter. He says, who cares that Amanda Knox might have killed her roommate? Chicks are hard. <laughs> eight. We have one coming in from James Brawley. He says, Amanda Knox is hot. She gets a pass for murder. Just leave her alone, Italy. Surly Patriots, Mikey Dog says, Amanda Knox is guilty of being too hot for prison. And, <laughs> and we have uh, a comment. There you go. Digital writes in from uh, HuffPost Live and says, look, this is all about money, which speaks to your point, Nina. And an interesting question comes in uh, from this comment, out of this comment, which says, we are fools if we let her go back to Italy and stand the same trial again. No evidence came forth, and the prosecutor only has a gut feeling that she is guilty. Richard, this is a legit question for a lot of Americans. How do we, uh, in a country that does not uh, budge on the, the, the double jeopardy issue, deal well, here, with the entire system that doesn't? Here's what's going to happen. What's going to happen is presumably she will be retried, and she will be retried but she will not be there. She will not be there. It will be done in, in absentia. In other words, there will be a trial without her, which could hurt her because where, she won't wait, be able to. Where will to... she be, Richard? Where will she be? She will be in Seattle. And, and she won't. She's and, not and going back to Italy no, so quickly. But that raises, uh, that raises one, more, one second, Richard. That raises another question for me. Is this just a dog? I mean, they know she ain't going back, right? I mean, do, do we really think that, that an American system will send her back? Do we really think that she'll allow herself to go back? If she's, well, if she's don't guilty forget, you, you, don't, you don't get to the extradition issue and the double jeopardy issue unless she is retried and reconvicted, right? So if she doesn't go back and if her defense team believes, as they've made very clear in the press for the last 48 hours, that there's not any chance that she's going to be convicted. And if she doesn't go back and they win, remember, they're going back to the same court that originally acquitted her. Okay, right. so if they go back. They make all these changes. The appellate court insists that they do, and she wins. We don't get to the extradition issue. She stays in Seattle. She finishes school, and she writes more books. So we don't get to this real constitutional versus extradition issue unless or until she's retried and reconvicted. No, no, I, I agree. But I'm just saying in terms of the, the kind of pragmatic assessment of the situation, worst case scenario happens. Does anybody really think that this woman is going to go back and finish a 26-year 26 26 prison sentence? No. no. Well, no, <laughs> nobody does. But but the question no. is not whether she voluntarily does it. The question is whether she is forced to do it. Um, but that, but, and that's what I'm serious. saying. Does the United? Do we even think that the United States would allow that to happen? To no. her? Well, 
listen, they did it in Mexico in 2010. They did it in Canada in, in uh, uh, 1974. So they have done it before. Uh, it will be a big issue. And the fact that she's a good-looking woman, as much as it isn't right, does come into play. That's I mean, all that I'm saying. About That's all I'm saying, Kay you know, Casey. I don't think we'll – I'm not saying we won't send anybody back to a country. Right. I'm saying, will, we, will we send her? I ain't saying we, I'm saying we ain't sending her. I, Right. Well, I mean, I, 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 we can't disagree, obviously, with the fact that, that a lot of the, at least the narrative surrounding her is about her looks, um, whether or not she is a, a hard A, as that comes <laughs> I'm not even sure I know what that means. But, uh, but it's also the fact, you know, you, that, that this is about a constitu the to the extent that, that the U.S. would deny an extradition request on the part of Italy, it's about a constitutional, an American constitutional issue that everybody knows about, everybody understands. The principle of double jeopardy, while complex when you get down to it, you know, as a nitty gritty constitutional matter, is a very, very simple idea that every lay citizen knows whether or not you've ever watched Law and Order. So, part, so you have all these different pieces coming together. You have, um, as you said, a very pretty young woman you have, who's white. You have someone who has been, uh, at least in the American view, the victim of a kind of bungled witch hunt who's been celebrated as every girl on our soil anyway, and then the issue that would theoretically get her sent back to Italy or not is one, again, that everybody understands, every American understands on some level what double jeopardy is. All of those things together, combined with the fact that she would already have to be retried once before she could even theoretically get sent back, I just can't imagine how it would ever happen. But you know, last question for like, last question for uh, that and that and a 250 will get me a cup of coffee, right? I mean, yeah. I don't know. How about that? I want to ask you guys one last question, or you all, you're not guys, the last question. Uh, if you're advising her, either as a lawyer or as a brilliant Italian journalist, do you do you release this book uh, in the middle of all this trial stuff? Do you release the book or do you wait? Uh, let me start with you, Antonio. You, if you were advising uh, Amanda Knox, would you tell her to release this blockbuster book or do you wait? It depends on, I mean, you know, what you want to achieve. Obviously, if you want to achieve popularity, I would advise her to release the book. But I think that, um, you know, people have problems with their releasing a book. And by the way, it's not just her. Her ex-boyfriend is releasing a book, a book as well, which is interesting. But I wouldn't advise her to do it from a legal point of view, I think. It would be a bit, you know, problematic. Casey, what say you? I think. I'm a lawyer. I'd have to say I'd have to review the book before I could advise you one way or the other. Oh, that, that's such right? a lawyerly response. <laughs> Richard, are you going to give me that same answer? You're going to lawyer up on me. I, I, I would say the same thing. I have to review the book, book and see if there's any cold, hard facts which, can, which will be published, which would eventually hurt her at the trial. Remember, okay. if she wrote a book, it's by definition an admission. And if they're retrying it, they could take a paragraph of that book and say, isn't it in fact, Ms. Ms. Knox said A, B, or C. And that could be damning. That being said, um, it's interesting because the book has already been written, so there may be a way to get it without it being I was published. Say, we, they could probably get it anyway. Yeah, yeah it's been written, it's, so it's they may be able to get it without it's it being like published. Away. What happened. So, so um, if I'm, I, I'd read it, but my gut would be to release that book because what I think the book tries to do, obviously we all know, it tries to explain in her eyes something she couldn't say at trial. And maybe if it's read and translated in Italian and read by the Italians, it will be they'll be more sympathetic and more understanding to her. I think the title of it is something about what I wanted to say, or it's a very interesting title. Uh, so I, I think it's a perfect follow. title. I think it's a yeah. perfect title, though, because it, it allows her to say, look, I wanted to be completely transparent about this. I wanted to say a million things, but the the, the legal hurdles that I had to surmount, the you know, the difficulties of, you know, legal ideology, you know, it just became so messy. I couldn't say everything I wanted to say, but now I have this great book. I can tell my story and you can see just how innocent and beautiful I am. The bottom line is you have a lawyer cleanse the book of anything that may be controversial or be an admission and then you release it. Well said. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us. We'll continue to follow this case and figure out what the heck is going on with Amanda Knox, both here and in Italy. Antonio, I want to thank you for joining us. Also, Casey. Thank you. And Nina had to run, but we thank her. And, of course, Richard, always good to see you as well, sir. In other court news, it appears that Jeffrey Tubin from CNN was hit over the head with an umbrella while reporting today outside the Supreme Court. Check out this tweet from HuffPost Media. Jeffrey Tubin says, Doma is in trouble. He is then hit by a giant umbrella. Hmm. Thanks for watching HuffPost Live. Mike Sachs will join us later from the latest Supreme Court updates.